Welcome to the Weekly Dose Podcast, your one-stop shop for the weekly news in incretin mimetic therapies with your host, Man on the Majaro, Dave Knapp. Welcome to On the Pin, the Weekly Dose. I'm your host, Dave Knapp, Man on the Majaro. That's why I'm here. You are on the pin. Wagobi, Saxenda, Victoza, Trilicity, Manjaro, Zepbound, Compound, that pen is what we talk about here at the Weekly Dose. It's your one-stop shop for incretin, mimetic, diabetes news, especially as it relates to the medications that are changing lives. It's so good to be with you here on what is the last podcast of the month of July, which is incredibly hard to believe this year. Like so many before it, have just continued to fly by. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started to let you know on the GLP-1 pen book drops in just a few weeks. Make sure you jump over to onthepen.com. Sign up for alerts. The link will be in the description of the show notes to sign up for alerts. Be the first to know when that book drops. I'm so excited to bring that to you again. The heart of this book is that it would help to sort of improve relationships with the loved ones in your life who who don't necessarily understand these medications, who don't necessarily understand the struggle of obesity. But if you could just hand them a book that would walk them through that step by step, I'm really hoping, my hope and prayer for this book is that it opens doors, opens conversations, and, and hopefully brings relationships, especially the most important relationships in your life, closer. Also, bonus point, if this book finds its way to people who don't know about these medications, who don't understand them and could benefit from them. That's the heart of this book. So we're going to get right into the news. Awesome, awesome news this week. We're just going to talk a little bit about Altimmune. Now, Altimmune is a company out of Maryland, started in the 1990s, and it's a clinical stage drug company. Basically, they've got multiple candidates in the pipeline, a lot of them dealing with issues of metabolic health, liver health, and they've got a phase one trial candidate that we've talked about it on the pen before called pemvidutide, which is a GLP-1 glucagon coagonist. So we've talked about uh, other medications in the pipeline that combine GLP-1 and glucagon like bredetrutide, which also adds GIP. We've talked about servodutide from Behringer Ingelheim, which is a phase three candidate. So that's much closer to hitting the market than pemvidutide is. But listen to these amazing results. And studies showed in a phase one trial that people had a 68% reduction in liver fat over 12 weeks. When you talk about liver health, these are just astounding numbers. And at 24 weeks, that number jumped up to 76.4. The weight loss was around 4.3% at week 12. But with that amount of liver fat melting off, you're talking about extreme improvements in overall metabolic metabolic health. So we'll be watching Altimmune closely over the next few years as they advance pembidutide into phase two clinical trials. Of course, you can follow all of that here at On The Pen. In Novo Nordisk news, Novo Nordisk announced that they have purchased land to build another plant in Sweden. This will be a finish and fill plant. So think pens, injector molds for pens, which is very exciting to hear that they are ramping up additional production. Of course, these pens, these are going to be the Ozempic and Wagovi pens, uh, respectively, uh, are the kink in the supply chain typically when it talk, when we talk about um, shortages of medications, whether we're talking about Novo Nordisk or Eli Lilly. And of course, we know that their new candidate that will hit the market sometime in late 2026, Cagrisema, which is a combination of Cagrilintide and Semaglutide, an amylin agonist in the GLP-1, receptor agonist. That's going to require a special pen that's different than either of these two because it has to be dual chambered. Caglarintide is actually uh, being an amylin agonist has different requirements for basically the way that it is stored long term in suspended in the liquid that ultimately you inject with. And so it cannot be combined in the same chamber in the same liquid as G, the GLP-1 analog semaglutide. So it is a dual chambered pen where, whereby uh, my presumption is you fire the pen and two plungers push down liquid from two chambers into one uh, syringe. So that sounds like a very complicated pen to manufacture, thus requiring additional 
manufacturing capacity uh, to make this pin. So I think that's probably what we're looking at here. This is launching uh, sometime in 2026, which is again, when we expect Kagger Sema to hit the market. And of course it would not be another week in Nova Nordisk if there wasn't another fire. Uh, on the 24th of July, just a couple of days ago, uh, Nova Nordisk experienced another fire in the basement uh, of one of their buildings. This is just crazy how frequently this has happened. I think this is the fourth or fifth time in the last couple of months that they've experienced somewhere in one of their facilities a fire. So this is just sort of interesting news. Uh, the European Union actually expanded the Wigovi label, which is exciting, to uh, include the reduction of heart attacks. Of course, this coming out of the select trials that we saw for Wigovi with the 2.4 milligram reduced uh, major MACE events, that's uh, major cardiovascular events, major adverse cardiovascular events, uh, in patients who took Wagovi who had heart failure. So we're seeing similar studies, of course, for terzepatide going on right now. And I think you'll see the same thing, the same sort of trajectory follow where we saw uh, that Medicare Part D plans added Wagovi for this. Now you see the European Union has gone ahead and added this. This is about six months out from the release of the select trial data. Later this year, we'll have that data on terzepatide. So I think it'll follow similar pattern where you'll see within six months of that clinical trial data dropping that we are, are feeling confident will be just as good, if not better, as the Wigovi trials that we'll see those added to Medicare formularies that we'll see it ultimately added uh, and the label expanded in the European Union as well. Now, this one is a pat yourself on the back sort of uh, story here, Roche. So you may remember Roche acquired a company called Carmot at the end of 2023 and acquired three obesity and diabetes assets. And we learned this week that they will be basically working to speed up the timeline for their pipeline drugs and hope to get one of the candidates to market by 2028. Of course, by 2028, we'll have Cagrasema, Redotrutide, high-dose semaglutide, high-dose terzepatide. So they're going to have pretty big shoes to fill, but bringing an, another, again, another man, drug manufacturer to the market, hopefully we'll have Viking Therapeutics by that time as well with BK2735, as, and presumably they'll get gobbled up by another player in the industry, uh, maybe Pfizer. Some people have speculated that Lilly might. I doubt that will happen. I think that already, uh, that ship has sailed on that one, but potentially Pfizer or a company like that could jump in and, and swoop that up. Uh, I think you might see Amgen be a player in that as, as Amgen's candidate, uh, AMG-133, the monoclonal antibody treatment uh, that is a GLP-1 and GIP antagonist. And uh, just not sure about that one. The, the, what we've seen Eli Lilly prove time and time again with the GIP is every time they ramp that up, they ramp up weight loss and the side effects go down, of course, Terzepatide being 5 to 1 GIP to GLP-1. And we learned last week that Redotrutide, their, their phase 3 clinical trial candidate with glucagon GIP and GLP-1, is a 15 to 1 ratio GIP to GLP-1. So they're really <laughs> some strong clinical trial results to show that, that actually a GIP agonism is the way to go. But Amgen-133 is a GIP antagonist. And the side effects in the early stage clinical trials, even though small sample size were very, very rough, even seeing half of the participants drop out of that phase one trial. So we'll see on that one. They're going to have to do a lot of work in phase uh, three trials to, to sort of mess with, tweak the, the titration schedule and even the frequency of dosing, because again, that's a once monthly. Uh, going off on a little bit of a tangent there, but all that to say, we'll have multiple players in the game at that point, whether Viking Therapeutics comes to market as Viking Therapeutics, doubt it, or they come to VK2735 comes to market under an Amgen umbrella or Pfizer. We'll see TBD on that one. You've seen other pharmaceutical companies, uh, some of these clinical stage pharmaceutical companies work with some of the bigger ones like Servidutide, where you saw uh, or are seeing currently uh, Bayringer Ingelheim working with a smaller company to bring Servidutide to market. So we'll see on that one. But Roche, this is where this is where I pat myself on the back here because the articles that came out about Roche, it's like, hey, Novo Nordisk and Lilly are dropping because of this new company uh, getting in the GLP-1 game. Roche, not a new company, but new 
a, a new to the GLP-1 game company uh, getting in the market. Of course, this article just dropped just last week, July 17th, where if you follow on the pen, May 11th, we did an article pointing out the very same thing about these candidates uh, that Roche has put together through their acquisition of Carmont Therapeutics. And so yeah, just a little plug for on the pens website, because you can either get it from the mainstream news in July, or you could have got this from on the pen back in May. So a little plug for on the pen weight watchers this week in weight watchers news. This was from Madison Muller over at Bloomberg. We saw the weight watchers chief medical officer step down after a year and, and the flies are just dropping at weight watchers. It has been a, a fantastic expose in in ruining one of the most iconic american brands to watch what weight watchers has done since their acquisition of sequence and their their introduction of glp1 treatments you know i thought when this marriage happened between sequence which was a a major telehealth provider um started by uh, among others uh, dr spencer nadalski and really a fascinating company in, a, in a, a marriage that on paper looked very promising and Weight Watchers just fumbled this thing in a in the most dramatic way. Uh, and it's just astounding to have watched this sort of play out as a marketer, as a salesperson, uh, just to see their, their pitch and their go to market has just been an interesting thing to watch. So we saw uh, Oprah divest uh, not too long ago and then run a couple of basically <laughs> GLP-1 Weight Watchers telethons, uh, obviously those are not uh, being impactful in the way that Weight Watchers would like them to be. A very interesting one to follow. Some very interesting news on FDA and compounding this week. So we learned this week that 503A pharmacies do not have to report to the FDA how many GLP-1 medications they're producing. Now, I find this fascinating because 503BR, and we've talked about this and on the pen going back to way earlier this year, the difference between 503A and 503B is the FDA oversight, right? And the fact that 503B manufacture drugs in scale to deal with shortages where 503A pharmacies are filling individual scripts. Now we saw, uh, we love Bloomberg over here, but Bloomberg posted this article about, are these cheap weight loss drugs any good? This dropped on the 24th and it went into the differences between 503A and 503B pharmacies. This dropped on July 24th. And of course, you could have got the same thing from on the pen in the form of a podcast, an article, and a YouTube video, Compounders Epitide Choosing the Right Source, which really was a deep dive into 503A, 503B pharmacies, dropped on April 13th. So again, just a plug, make sure that you're following on the pen.com, sign up for those email alerts. Not only will you be the first to know when the book drops here in a few weeks, but you'll also get updates on all these articles that we post so that you can be months ahead of what the mainstream media is going to report on this stuff. We are the news in GLP-1 and on the pen. So thank you for being a part of it. Of course, we learned also from FDA compounding this week, and I did a video over on TikTok and YouTube about this as well. So if you want to go a little bit deeper here, but we've seen some reports of uh, from the FDA this week in overdoses in on uh, GLP-1 medications. Now, this is what I find fascinating is that this information sort of drops amid a whole slew of additional sort of negative press about compounded medications. And I think what you're seeing here is you're seeing big pharma really leverage relationships within the FDA. Uh, you're seeing them re leverage relationships within the media to sort of cast a, a dark cloud over compounds. And of course, this is something that we've been warning about uh, from on the pen for a long, long time, uh, where we expected the waters to get muddied between uh, sort of the gray market uh, versions of these medications. And of course, the the shortage, the compound pharmacy versions of these uh, medications. And you're seeing this play out in real time. And of course, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk would love to see nothing more than uh, compounds to be shut down, but they cannot. And, and by design, right? Because they have brought drugs to market. They have continued to aggressively market these medications in the face of unprecedented demand for these medications, leaving patients high and dry. I will continue to advocate for the accessibility of compounded medications from safe sources. And we're going to be loud about it because the pharmaceutical companies have failed us when it comes to 
providing an adequate supply of these medications. And so I am a firm believer that 503B pharmacies have existed for exactly this role to make medications accessible in the face of shortages like the ones that we're facing with Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. On the topic of compounded medications, of accessibility, of patient advocacy, I would like to formally announce that uh, I have been brought on to the team at Roe as a community advisor. And so as a community advisor with Roe, they are also helping to sponsor the work that we do here at On The Pen. So make sure you give Roe some love on social media. Let them know how happy you are that they're working with Dave Knapp and On The Pen. There was a really interesting article from Roe this week that really delved deeply in into this idea of muscle mass loss on a GLP-1. And I just wanted to bring up this chart specifically because I thought that this was a particularly useful when you talk about bariatric surgery, diet and exercise, non-GLP-1 pharmacotherapy or GLP-1 pharmacotherapy. So you're seeing what the, what the total body weight loss is in the first column there. And then in the second column, you're seeing what the fat-free mass loss is, and then the skeletal muscle mass loss. And so what you're really seeing here is that weight loss with GLP-1 therapy is really on par with normal weight loss, and in some cases, even better when we're talking about preserving muscle mass and, and lean muscle mass. We want weight loss to improve as we go along uh, and study a lot of the pipeline medications that are coming to market, especially from the companies that have been in this game for a while, no, Lily and Novo. You're seeing, and you saw this in a, the conversation that I had with Dr. Beverly Chang just a couple of weeks ago, the quality of weight loss is only going to get better with these drugs. That is a huge area of focus for both Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. And so don't buy into the fear, the uncertainty, and the doubt that is cast in the media uh, and with many of the talking heads on social media who would rather you remain sick, you remain marginalized, your obesity remain untreated. Don't buy into the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The numbers speak for themselves. Thank you for being here with me this week. Thank you for being the best part of On The Pen. Please make sure if you enjoy this podcast, Give it a five-star rating and review. Consider uh, supporting the channel if you would like to support us financially. It helps to support the work that we do here. You can do that very simply by becoming a member on the YouTube channel. For just a couple of dollars a month, you're going to get access to the video version of this uh, about a day or two before the rest of the world gets to see it. And you'll get access to custom videos just for members. And of course, our members-only live stream that happens before our Thursday night show on the pen live every Thursday night. Thank you for those who are already doing that. Thank you for those who are helping out by liking, saving, sharing. Those are great forms of advocacy that cost you nothing but the energy that it takes to move your thumbs. So thank you to everyone who likes, comments, subscribes, and gives this podcast a five-star rating and review. You are making it happen. So much exciting things going on. Can't wait to continue to share uh, some of the exciting things. Again, make sure you go over and give Ro some positive feedback about partnering with On The Pen. Until next week, we will see you on the pen. Y'all have a great week. Thanks for joining me this week.